When starting on the path of tabletop RPGs through Dungeons and Dragons, like many of us, I was taught that puzzles played a very important part in the game. A good game, or more likely a good dungeon, consisted of a healthy balance of exploration, social encounters, puzzles, and combat. The tried and true winning recipe. Though in all the games I played, I haven't in the end encountered that many puzzles. And as a game master, I haven't run that many either. And even fewer successful ones. I like riddles, brain teasers, ciphers, mysteries, and even used to work in an escape room and yet I struggle to bring that into role-playing games because they're really hard to get right. They can easily break immersion. You as a GM have very little control over the pacing of the puzzle. It could take seconds or it could be long and frustrating and cause the game to lose momentum. And momentum is a thing far too precious to risk. Protect it with your life. Truth is, we start maybe at the wrong end of the issue. There's a huge difference between creating a puzzle and creating a puzzle specifically intended for RPG. We think about crafting smart brain teasers, but ultimately narration and interactivity are the bones and blood of role-playing games. Ideally, we want our puzzles to be filled with bones and blood. So let's bring it on, let's build our puzzles not as puzzle makers, but as storytellers. And we'll start with an example. Tell me, would you like to hear a riddle? Or would you prefer this? You open the door to a room so dark that even dark vision won't help you. The inside is completely shrouded, but not still and not silent. You are not alone in the room. As you step in, you can hear disgusting squelching sounds, along with the raspy, disembodied cooing hum of a lullaby, the source of which is hard to discern. Any person sound of mind would likely try and shed some light on their predicament. As a torch is lit, you finally catch a glimpse of your surroundings in a dim light. Instead of floors, walls and ceilings, all here is made of messy, intertwined bare flesh and sinew. You've no time to take it all in because as soon as the light hits the flesh, it violently contracts and shrieks. The shrieking targets whoever caused this light to appear with dissonant whispers, or whatever other damage-dealing mechanic is appropriate to your game. And mere split seconds later, the light is snuffed out in a single wet breath. Or wet dispel magic, should it be magical light. Once the light is out, the shrieking dies down. Soon replaced with the same soft lullaby you heard before. You stand again in complete darkness, but now you've caught a glimpse of just what kind of horror lies in there with you. How do you deal with that situation? We'll get back to that soon and see the solution, but ideally this is more the kind of pace and vibe I'm looking for. I want my puzzles seamlessly woven into the narration, for them to call my players to action, to be engaging. And now that we know where we're going, let's see a few ways that we can get there. First, by taking off the GM and puzzle crafter hats and starting the process from the point of view of the players who are going to roleplay their characters through it. Turn your puzzles into dilemmas, roleplay opportunities, or creative prompts. Basically, just write the situation that you would like to describe your own character going through. Have your players come up with a poem or enact something, or if your group loves drama, then create a puzzle that just eats secrets. Force them to reveal something and then let them deal with the consequences of the secret now being in broad daylight. I have another idea and example but anyone who doesn't want spoilers for Curse of Strat should skip to here. In Curse of Strat, a puzzle at the entrance of Van Richten's tower requires the players to dance according to specific moves in a specific order. And you absolutely should get your players to stand up and perform it. Having your players use their bodies also immediately gets them engaged. In short, a puzzle that requires direct action and creativity from your players will always be more engaging. Two, think about context. Often puzzles don't entirely make sense when taken as part of a whole. The actual logic within a puzzle could be flawless, but still make you wonder why would this be here? Say to enter the cultist's lair, you have to answer a riddle, and once that password is spoken, you can pass through. But if a puzzle was meant to keep outsiders out, then why would the riddle be written by the door? To help outsiders figure out the answer? The cultists don't need to write the riddle by the door, they just need to remember the password. Bad cultists. Bad. This is an extreme example, but even so, all the clues to a puzzle are usually scattered in the general vicinity. Which is fair, in a meta sense, you don't want your players to get stuck, but there needs to be a coherent story reason for these clues to be here. For example, it makes sense to scatter clues if your puzzle was intended as some sort of trial for the new members of a secret society. Or if the puzzle is part of a ghost's unfinished business, then clues about their death or even manifestations from the spirit itself are story-relevant ways to help your players. Because the ghost does want to finish their business, this also gives you opportunities to think creatively about the format of your puzzle. Riddles and door puzzles largely dominate the playground, but they can get redundant over time. And I refuse to be predictable. 
3. If you play in person and are a creative spirit who enjoys making props for RPG, then play with that. When I first started GMing, I wanted to use a cipher and a letter as a puzzle, and I could have done a lot better with the execution. Instead of just leaving it there, I could have created a physical cipher wheel to hand to my players so they can decode secret messages between cultists. Players will maybe have more fun with ciphers if they find this object that they can actually hold in their hands. You could use invisible ink and a tiny UV flashlight, or actual locks on little chests, or even a timer to up the pressure. If there's still enough of a child in us to spend hours playing pretend, then there's also a good chance that we are children enough to enjoy playing with toys. 4. Your puzzle could easily turn into just a wall. What I mean by this is your players could figure out the answer quickly or they could go in circles forever. Well, maybe not forever, but in game time a few minutes without progress can feel like forever and there you're stuck facing a wall. If that happens, do not make your players roll for intelligence to get the answer. No, no, no. Maybe they'll succeed on the roll, but it won't feel like a success. Instead, when designing the puzzle, think of a backup plan. Think of three different ways the party could still achieve their goal. That way, even if your players don't have the answer to the puzzle, they still get to feel accomplished, because they will have found a creative solution to counter the problem. 5. If you want your puzzles to be as entertaining and fun as possible, rather than looking for puzzle examples, look for minigame examples. Minigames in RPGs are super fun, like well-crafted skill challenges at a festival or playing some variant of blackjack that uses dice instead of cards when your party is just chilling and gambling at a tavern. When you think about it, puzzles and minigames act kind of similarly in RPGs. They are both a halt in the pacing of the game, but ideally, rather than break immersion, they are shifting the gears of immersion. And minigames are a lot easier to get right than puzzles on that front. Campfire games are great with this, because they're played with children, and that means they're meant to entertain people with a short attention span. And when it comes to make-believe, our attention span is not always all there. Now how about seeing some of these ideas put to use? Remember that room made of flesh that we mentioned earlier? Let's get back to it. The sleeping room is in part a puzzle, in part a trap. It has been placed here to guard the path, an important item, whatever seems fit to your scenario's needs. The room is awakened and conscious in some way. It sleeps peacefully, soothing itself with a melody, almost behaving like some scared baby. But any source of light will deeply upset it. The key is to trust the thing in the darkness, and to let the thing in the darkness trust you. Various acts of empathy and kindness could earn you that trust, by talking softly to it or humming along to its lullaby. Of course, it's going to feel scary as the creature gets curious about this new presence. You can take it one step further, since your players can't see anything, ask them to close their eyes so they can really sit in that darkness. There are very few things more unsettling than some abnormally lodged tongue licking your arm, even better when you can't see what's doing it. But as you gain the sleeping room's trust, it guides you through its entrails. And by reshaping its own fleshy structure, it creates a passage or frees whatever object or person it was holding captive. I like this puzzle as a way to play with tone, giving you lovely opportunities to creep out your players. You can even find ways to link this to your lore. Perhaps this cursed creature has taken form from the remains of soldiers or sacrifices who died a horrible death, some fragment of their self lingering, still seeking this rest and empathy and fleeing from the fire that harmed them. Or you can give as a pet to your big bad evil. It doesn't have to be a door puzzle either. Perhaps instead of guarding something, a failed mage experiment is spreading in the academy just overtaking its walls and ceilings. Soothing the creature will convince it to shrink itself to a much more manageable size. And then the mage can keep it as a pet. Let's move on to another example of a puzzle. This one is pretty much just a minigame that's played in summer camps in my home country. It's called Draw a Moon, but here we'll rename it as the Dragon Potion. The way this works is someone will grab an imaginary paintbrush and draw a moon in the air. They will then keep passing it from person to person around the circle so everyone can try. If you've done it right, you'll be told, oh yeah, that's a beautiful moon. If you do it wrong though, you'll be booed. Whatever it was that you drew, it was not a moon. Thing is, it doesn't actually matter what shape you draw in the air. What really makes the moon beautiful is whether or not you said thank you to the person handing you the brush. If you said thank you when receiving the brush, even if you drew a disgusting pile of garbage, it still counts as a beautiful 
beautiful moon. You can adapt this even with changing the theme a little bit. For example, your party's current mission requires some investigation. And there are direct witnesses who could help you gain a crucial piece of information. The bad news is the witnesses in question are children. They saw something but don't necessarily take the whole situation seriously. Of course, this only works if what they saw is relatively benign. If they were witnesses to a murder, they're probably traumatized at this point. As children, they're playful and stubborn and like to mess with the adults. Before they tell you anything, you have to prove yourself worthy of their little game, the Dragon Warriors, by playing a game with them. In this case, the game will be called the Dragon Potion. Instead of drawing a moon with an imaginary paintbrush, they will have you take a sip from an imaginary potion that supposedly makes you breathe fire like a dragon. Pretend to take a sip, blow in the air, and if you said thank you to the person who gave you the potion, then everyone will cheer and say, wow, you're like a dragon. And now they will tell you what they saw. Really mind this imaginary potion all the way. First, the confusion in your players is really entertaining to watch, but it's also really fun to have them roleplay dealing with children, and it's not often that we get puzzles as social encounters. It's also very unlikely that your players will get stuck. For one, the kids don't really care about keeping what they saw a secret, they just want to entertain themselves along the way. After some time, they will even guide their new playmates in the right direction by just really, really exaggerating the way they see. Thank you. Another way to solve this is if the players can actually breathe fire or create an illusion, the kids will adore them. And if the players really get stumped, there's probably a quiet kid isolated from the group that they could make friends with and who would teach them the trick. Or you could do what snitches do. Go tell their mom that they're interfering with an investigation. Snitch. There. I think I'm all done. I hope that you'll take some of this with you, though I'd like to end it all by simply saying that there's no cookie cutter puzzle recipe. Everything always depends on your table, so just like everything else in the game, tailor your puzzles to your players. This is where all of this really comes together. On this note, good evening, and may the dice god's fortune shine favorably upon you.